Great, wonderful, uh, uh, David. Thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, to this workshop. I'm I'm uh, really enjoying this workshop. Um, I, I like the topic of this workshop. I regret I probably will not be able to contribute that much uh, to the uh, topic itself. We we really uh, are not working on computational aspects of. Um, of this of this uh, interesting problem in my group the closest we get to computation is that we we have a doe funded center uh, at columbia and at the university of washington called uh, programmable quantum materials so so there is some uh, some tone of computational maybe in the title of the center but we really mean somewhat different uh, things in mind uh, when we talk about programmable phenomena uh, I will uh, tell you more about this. There will be a lot about polaritons, and polaritons are certainly heavily uh, mentioned in this uh, in this uh, in this workshop. But I'm uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm really uh, very happy to be a, a part of this workshop and to listen and to learn uh, from uh, from this uh, from this amazing group. And I'm joining live from New York today. It's uh, Tuesday morning. Um, in this talk, uh, I, I would like to explore <coughs> a somewhat overlooked uh, aspect of uh, uh, and overlooked potential, perhaps, of uh, polaritons. Um, I often like to think of polaritons as of a tool, as a spectroscopic tool, a tool, a novel tool that enables us to uh, uh, to explore the physics of uh, interesting quantum materials in novel ways, specifically the physics of Van der Waals materials that will be the focus of uh, today's topic. So here is a clear idea, and this is a sort of a cartoon pictorial representation of a, of a, a plasma polariton as of a as of a ripple of electron density triggered with light that can travel on the surface of uh, studied materials. Um, uh, and this traveling aspect of polaritons is very important for us. Uh, as polariton, the polaritons can be literally launched by the tip of our near field, uh, near field apparatus. And then we explore in real space through imaging how uh, the standing wave patterns of uh, polaritons on the surface of our, our studied materials, sometimes through the bulk of heterostructures. And that enables novel spectroscopy opportunities. Conventional spectroscopy is all about the color, how much light of a different color is reflected, emitted, absorbed, transmitted. So polaritonic spectroscopy is uh, suddenly becoming about shapes. And uh, we will be examining in our experiments uh, uh, these uh, this standing wave patterns uh, formed by, by polaritonic waves in different classes of materials. So all information is actually from real space uh, imaging. The closest uh, condensed matter analog to this is quasiparticle interference that's, uh, that has been practiced in scanning tunnel and microscopy community for, for many years now. Uh, and the difference here is, uh, is that we are doing this with light, with, uh, with nano light, with this compact uh, polaritonic waves that we can launch and visualize. So that's the, the key idea and that's my my key uh, message message in this talk. I will try to cover uh, four different topics in this in this talk. First of all, I would like to to, to discuss a, a variety of polaritonic effects that we uh, we experience in in Van der Waals materials, and then I will talk about polaritons with a twist. Uh, this is about uh, uh, moiré super lattices that can be formed in many different classes of uh, Van der Waals materials. Uh, many of these uh, materials can be uh, fabricated or exfoliated uh, in the form of a single atomic monolayer. So if you put one monolayer on top of the other monolayer, if you are in perfect registry, you actually don't see anything. Uh, but if you rotate one layer with respect to each other, then you start seeing this periodic uh, super lattices with periodicity determined by the angle of, uh, uh, of by the twist angle between the two layers. So if you are thinking of uh, this uh, this rotation 
minor rotation changes in a major way all of the properties of, of this um, heterostructures there. Excitonic behavior, the polaritonic behavior, the electronic transport, uh, heat transport even, and the light transport in the form of uh, uh, plasma polaritons that I will discuss in more details. So if you are thinking of, a, uh, of an array of emitters, for example, and that has been discussed in several talks yesterday, then this, uh, this uh, tunable system, rotatable system, allow you to uh, in operando uh, uh, control of, 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 this, uh, of these emitters, and that's perhaps of some interest to, to, to this community. So I will discuss plasma polaritons in this uh, type of systems, and then I will talk about another polaritonic platform where the, um, the active, uh, sort of the polaritonic uh, medium is continuous. This again will be a layer of Van der Waals material, but the electrostatic environment forms a, a more a more a pattern or, or any pattern we wish. And effectively, this uh, this uh, this uh, type of devices with uh, structured uh, gate electrodes uh, act as photonic crystals for for polaritons. All of these, uh, uh, all of our abilities to investigate and visualize polaritons rely on scanning probe uh, uh, methods, in particular nano-optical methods. And there is quite a variety of these methods now uh, available, all based on uh, some form of coupling of light to, to uh, scanning probes, to the scanning antennas. You can functionalize, functionalize these antennas so that you uh, 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 record a particular type of a contrast from in this in these experiments. Each of these type of contrasts carries a separate message about the studied physics. We've been able to combine these antennas in one apparatus, and that's what we call multi-messenger nanoimaging. So, so this is the outline of my talk. I actually would enjoy questions any time during talk. I will not be able to read uh, chat, but, uh, but if I may ask uh, Peter to perhaps uh, try to do it or, uh, and uh, read the questions, or maybe Peter can un unmute uh, 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 participants and uh, let them ask questions by, uh, by voice. Uh, so this is how we do nano-optics uh, in our lab at Columbia. Uh, the key element is the scanning probe uh, apparatus. It could be a AFM, could be uh, STM. It's illuminated with light. We collect signal only from the area underneath the apex of the tip. And even with commercial tips, you go to length scales as uh, short as 5 to 10 nanometers. The rest of the optical path is in free space. So you can put any light source you want here. This could be a visible laser, this could be a microwave source. And so with this, and the, but the length scale is totally decoupled now from the wavelength of your light. It's solely determined by the uh, apex of the tip. And so you beat the diffraction by three, four, five, six orders uh, of magnitude. And then through raster scanning, you obtain uh, any form uh, of contrast you, you may wish. We have not invented this technique. This has been done by others. In particular, Fritz Keilmann in Munich has introduced, uh, uh, has pioneered many aspects of this technique. But in my group, what we've done, we, we adapted this, uh, this uh, powerful imaging technique to conditions uh, that are needed for condensed matter physics. First and foremost, these are cryogenic temperatures. Uh, these ice cubes uh, uh, is a pictorial representation of cryogenic temperatures. I can assure you that there is no ice in our cryostat. In fact, it was quite a challenge to, to do these kind of experiments at, uh, at low temperatures. And we added optical uh, pulses. We can do these experiments with uh, uh, ultra-fast laser sources, and that gives us also transient information, time-resolved information with, uh, on time scales down to few tens of uh, uh, femtoseconds. So this is a, this is a uh, quick introduction to polaritons in Van der Waals materials. I think this community is, uh, uh, doesn't need much introduction, so you know that you form a, a, a surface uh, 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 plasma polariton, for example, at, the, at an interface between medium with positive dielectric function and negative dielectric function. 
uh, free electron Dirac electrons in graphene or in other classes and, uh, of Van der Waals crystals like black phosphorus, for example, uh, serve as an excellent uh, as an excellent uh, 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 a source of the negative dielectric function at uh, at infrared frequencies. These uh, polaritons are very compact uh, in Van der Waals materials. Uh, this is a dispersion that I think this community is also very well. Uh, aware of. Uh, so at, uh, at the reasonable um, frequencies where the uh, surface plasma polariton is still far away from, from the photon line, uh, this, this confinement can easily uh, uh, be uh, as high as two orders of magnitude and in, in some special cases even three orders of magnitude. So these are compact but propagating modes. So you can harness these modes to study uh, new physics of a, of a medium supporting this, uh, this uh, plasma polaritons. And that's what we are doing routinely now in our experiments. If you are interested in lattice dynamics, then, uh, then phonon polaritons also supported by Van der Waals solids are, uh, are your friends perhaps. Phonon polaritons are, are very interesting in this class of materials and could be a topic of a uh, uh, separate uh, talk, they in particular, they enable so-called hyperbolic uh, behavior when, when waveguide modes travel through the, through the bulk of a crystal in the uh, in, in near, near, polarito, near um, infrared active phonon modes. And uh, this in bulk three-dimensional crystals, this type of waveguiding is prohibited, but, uh, but this laid materials, they, they support it and this, these modes are quite exciting. So if you are interested in lattice dynamics, then uh, phonon polaritons are perhaps your friends. If you are interested in semiconductor physics, you can try to form accident polaritons. And I think this uh, community is particularly excited about opportunities with accident polaritons in, in uh, more conventional uh, semiconductors, but they are also supported by, by Van der Waals solids that uh, offer a variety of semiconducting uh, substances. My favorite polaritons are actually Cooper pair plasma polaritons. And uh, uh, here the, so the origin of the negative dielectric function comes from superfluid density. I, I like these polaritons because, because they are lossless. They are fundamentally lossless uh, uh, because the superconducting condensate is, uh, is uh, lossless, at least in principle, this uh, form of plasma polaritons could travel over infinitely long distances on, uh, on surface of uh, superconductors. For completeness, I'll mention magnetic uh, polaritons as well. Many uh, Van der Waals materials are ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic and there are uh, res strong resonances that, uh, that uh, produce uh, 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 polaritonic behavior in, in infrared frequencies. Uh, so in Van der Waals materials, we, we also routinely encounter so-called hybrid uh, polaritons. So uh, uh, Van der Waals materials are amenable to uh, many uh, fabrication methods that are not uh, accessible in conventional semiconductor physics. You can easily put one layer of, uh, uh, of Van der Waals materials on top of the other. And if uh, this layer hosts uh, plasma polaritons and uh, underlying layer hosts uh, phonon polaritons, then you actually can form very easily hybrid modes that are hybrids of plasmons and phonons or plasmons or, or, and, and excitons or, or, or any other varieties are possible here. Nano-optics community is making, uh, I think, very good progress with uh, understanding and with investigating all of this. These three types of uh, polaritons have been uh, imaged and visualized Superfluid plasma polaritons have not been seen yet. Uh, there's a, a competition and race between several groups to, to do that. Uh, somebody is going to see them eventually because we know they exist. But uh, let me tell you how we um, image others. Yes, and before I go into imaging, I should say that uh, plasma polaritons provide us with unique insights, uh, or, or any polaritons provide us with unique insights into the physics of uh, of, of these uh, systems. So, uh, and that's because the response uh, function uh, uh, of, uh, of a material uh, uh, determines, uniquely determines the dispersion of this, of this polaritonic waves. 
And as you will see in, in just a moment, this, uh, this dispersion is experimentally accessible from direct imaging. Uh, so, uh, so that uh, um, aspect of polaritons sort of completes, uh, completes this circle. From the images, you can obtain the response function through, through, through determining uh, uh, the, the dispersion. And, and that sets the stage for quantitative uh, inferences that you may want to extract about your, your, your medium, specifically about response functions that are not only frequency, but also momentum dependent. So this is how uh, polaritonic imaging works with, uh, with the tip. You, you select the range of the, you select the frequency of your lasers such that it goes into the uh, curved region of the dispersion. And then the tip of your near field apparatus acts as a launching, uh, as a launcher of polaritonic uh, waves that uh, travel on the surface. So the purpose of the tip is to convert uh, a free space light into high momentum modes that are confined to the surface. And you can catch this polaritonic wave with another tip if you wish. This is doable, but this is not very practical. And what's, uh, what we are typically doing instead is, is the following. We form uh, uh, standing waves uh, between, uh, uh, between, uh, between the tip and the physical edge of our crystals. Uh, and uh, so we launch the wave, we collect the reflected wave, and we send light to the detector. And in the raster scanned image, uh, these polaritonic waves look uh, like oscillations uh, of, of our near field signal, starting from the interior of the sample, going to the physical edge of the sample. So this is the first time we were able to image these waves at cryogenic temperatures. You see uh, uh, that uh, uh, plasma polaritons are still compact, but can travel uh, uh, over microns inside the uh, crystal because the losses at low temperatures are fairly low. Um, from these oscillations, we, we, read, uh, 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 we read relevant uh, uh, K value. We know at what frequency we do the measurements at the intersection of these two points. We, we get uh, an experimental result for this, for this dispersion. And we can do this, uh, uh, you know, we have to do it. If we work with monochromatic lasers, we have to do it point by point. So this is a tedious process, but, but doable, or in some situations we can use uh, broadband lasers and then determine a large uh, segment of this dispersion in one, in one shot. Back to Moiré uh, uh, super lattices. So, so you take two hexagonal sheets, you rotate one with respect to each other, and you start seeing uh, this, uh, this periodic pattern that's governed by the uh, twist angle between the layers. If uh, your Van der Waals layers were to remain rigid, that's all what you would observe. But in reality, it turns out that Van der Waals layers behave as, um, as deformable membranes. And uh, the energetics of different stacking regions that you see in this pattern is different. And uh, because these regions can deform, they try to minimize areas of where uh, stacking energy is high and uh, they try to maximize areas where stacking energy is low. The net result is that you have a triangular lattice that is seen directly in uh, TEM images at, uh, in uh, two twisted layers of uh, bilayer graphene. We see this tri uh, triangular lattice very clearly in non-infrared images. So, so here the wavelength of infrared light is, uh, is chosen such that no polaritons are traveling yet. So this is uh, a readout of a local contrast uh, due to local conductivity in this uh, type of uh, structures. You see that the contrast associated with, uh, with the domains themselves is basically indistinguishable, but the contrast at the domain walls is enhanced and that's consistent with enhanced conductivity associated with this uh, domain walls separating triangular domains. So now we will uh, harness uh, plasma and polaritons to, to explore uh, the physics of domains and domain walls. Uh, I'm coming back to this cartoon again, where the tip of our near field apparatus is launching this plasmonic waves. Uh, 
this is a cartoon, but it's so fairly accurate in a sense that the wavelength of, of, this, of these plasmonic waves is uh, commensurate with spacing of more or less superlattice. And that's very, uh, very uh, interesting now. So picture this, the tip of the near field apparatus now uh, launches a, a plasmonic wave that travels from somewhere towards, uh, towards the domain wall. And then it, uh, it cannot continue unimpeded through this domain wall because the conductivity here is enhanced. So we have some form of uh, plasmonic uh, impedance mismatch. And there is a probability that this wave becomes uh, partially reflected and some of it will, will continue uh, to move forward. And if you look at this network uh, formed by domain walls, you see that this is a, this is a network of periodic reflectors for plasmonic uh, waves that can travel on the surface of the crystal. And so now if we tune the wavelength of uh, light such that it launches these polaritonic waves, we start seeing fairly complex patterns. They, they, they preserve the symmetry of this, of this uh, network, but, but they show quite complicated behavior. If we change the wavelength of this, of this plasma polariton a little bit, we, the symmetry is still preserved, but the but uh, some regions become darker, some brighter. It's fairly complex uh, evolution of this contrast. And this is work of Sai Sunko in, uh, in our group at, uh, at Columbia. And together with my uh, collaborator uh, in all of these projects, Michael Fogler at UCSD, we were able to reproduce all aspects of this, uh, of this complex evolution of, uh, of uh, standing wave patterns. Michael's theory is essentially is a bookkeeping theory. There is one single parameter in this theory, which is the conductivity of the main wall. And then the bookkeeping is in proper adding of phases of reflected and transmitted, uh, transmitted waves. And, uh, and through this exercise, he has been able to, to reproduce all subtle features uh, observed in the experiment. So, so what happens at these domain walls? And that, become, that is uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat interesting. Uh, and uh, by now we understand this quite, uh, quite well. Uh, uh, so this is related to reconstructed electronic structure at the domain wall. So this is the electronic structure of bilayer graphene. Uh, we work with, uh, with heavily gated bilayer graphene. We need that to, to have uh, uh, plasma polaritons in the first place. Um, and it turns out that uh, uh, topologically, these two domains, AB and BA, even though they don't produce uh, 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 obvious contrast here, uh, topologically they are distinct. And uh, a very basic premise of topological band theory is that you, you actually cannot close this gap uh, going from one domain to another. With a, uh, you cannot cross this gap. Uh, across this boundary between one domain to another without closing gap. And that's exactly what happens at the domain wall. So there are extra edge states that are formed at the domain wall. These are cousins in, uh, in, uh, in edge states in, say, quantum Hall systems, except for, for now these edge states are present in the interior of our samples, not just at the physical boundary of our sample. And these extra states are responsible for addition additional conductivity associated in infrared frequencies that acts as a, as a polaritonic uh, uh, reflector. So this periodic network of domain walls is not any different from a, a photonic crystal, but now uh, uh, for, for, these, uh, for these waves, but there are some differences with conventional photonic crystals or metamaterials. Uh, um, so this, uh, this medium is continuous. We are not drilling any holes in this medium. This medium is continuous. And uh, um, a reflections of uh, a plasmonic wave happens because of quantum effect, because of reconstruction of the electronic structure at the domain wall. These objects are self-assembled. You don't, again, you don't need to drill any holes here. You, you, all what you need to do is to rotate one layer with respect to each other, and then you get this network, uh, a network with, uh, with variable period also. So these are also tunable and reconfigurable uh, crystal, uh, photonic crystals. And we took this notion of reconfigurable uh, literally with the help of my collaborators, Corey Dean and uh, 
and uh, Jim Holm, uh, they have been able to fabricate structures where you can rotate one layer with respect to another uh, just by pushing, by literally pushing on this layer with the tip of an atomic force microscope. So you see here in the left panel an AFM movie uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a disc of uh, Van der Waals material being rotated above, above some, some, some complicated structures. And we, we can study uh, plasmid polaritons and control of plasmid polaritons in this type of uh, uh, structures. We can uh, modulate, we can uh, change the reflection of these waves depending on the orientation of the disk. So, so this, is, uh, this is an example of what we call a programmable uh, quantum material. We, we literally dial uh, the angle uh, uh, to this uh, disk and relative alignment of the layers and we obtain different polaritonic behavior. Uh, now I would like to uh, tell you a little bit uh, more about uh, multi messenger imaging and about uh, our ability to modify a very large variety of properties of Van der Waals materials uh, through, uh, through twisting uh, neighboring layers. So uh, as you may be aware, uh, um, there are at least dozen of different uh, scanning probe uh, methods, so optical scanning probe methods that allow us to read out different types of contrast from these type of experiments. You know, I talked about non-infrared uh, already, but you can do Raman experiments in the same way. You can do photoluminescence experiments in the same way. You can do nonlinear spectroscopy, uh, second harmonic generation uh, combined with magnetic force mic microscopy and so on. And this is just a subset of what's uh, currently available. In the past, these different methods used to be housed in separate instruments. What we've been able to do, we build a cryogenic system that uh, combines in one apparatus, in one home-built apparatus, all these uh, different imaging modalities, maybe up to a dozen of different imaging modalities. And uh, this tool is really, really uh, uh, capable, we think, for, for the studies of, uh, of uh, um, Van der Waals assistance, specifically of more super lattices in Van der Waals systems. And because, and this, the purpose of this slide is to demonstrate that quite a variety of properties can be modified by a twist angle. I talked about polaritons already, but uh, about plasma polaritons, but you can do the same thing with lattice dynamics and with phonon polaritons. This uh, hexagonal pattern shows a more uh, uh, more as super lattice in twisted uh, Van der Waals insulator. It uh, happens to be hexagonal boron nitride. We coupled the broadband infrared laser to our uh, nanoprobe, and we were able to, to see how phonon spectra are impacted by this, uh, by, by this uh, super lattice. I already talked about plasma polaritons. I'll skip this part. Uh, you can also uh, um, visualize uh, uh, local DC transport using these nano-optical methods. This map uh, uh, that's unpublished, but maybe, but now it's, uh, it's going to be recorded. Uh, this map is uh, essentially is a map of DC, local DC conductivity. In this experiment, we still eliminate the tip with light, but we record a photo current uh, in this measurement and it visualizes this network of this excessive conductivity at the domain wall. This technique was invented by uh, Frank Coppins and Rainer Hillenbrand in Spain and we uh, extensively utilize it. You can set up this experiment slightly differently and you also record the local maps of local Zabeck coefficient and uh, so, so you can even record thermal problems. I talked about local conductivity uh, already. So uh, in the semiconducting uh, Van der Waals materials, it's, uh, it's useful to be able to obtain flexoelectric contrast that's, uh, that is a counterpart. Uh, this is the only non-optical measurement in this map, uh, but flexoelectricity is, a, is, a count, is uh, uh, related and, uh, and uh, complementary to our measurements of local uh, lattice dynamics. We also study ferromagnetism uh, simultaneously with infrared contrast, and we see uh, we can visualize correlations between magnetic and optical 
uh, responses. We are trying to add uh, STM to the same platform and we are having uh, some success with that with, in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Abhay Pasipathy. So, um, I, so I've spent uh, 30 minutes now, so should I leave uh, five minutes for questions and go to, go to my summary and leave five Yeah, minutes? if you could go to the summary now, that would be good, then we can have questions. Okay. So, so that's very easy, so, so that's, uh, I'll just uh, switch to my summary. Uh, and this is my summary. So this was about uh, polaritons and visualizing polaritons on the surface of Van der Waals materials. Uh, I primarily discussed more or less super lattices. You can also generate the super lattices by modulating uh, the dielectric environment of your active polaritonic layer and multi-messenger uh, nano-imaging methods are very powerful in uh, helping us to understand, uh, control, and program the, at the local uh, uh, scale uh, 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 different uh, types of properties in the structures. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much. And some uh, virtual applause. Thank you. Very good. So um, just a reminder to everybody that if you have questions, please send them to me in the chat and I'll either read them or I'll uh, 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 unmute you and uh, let, let you speak. Um, let me just start with a, a, a quick question. So wh what's the shortest wavelength that you can get to with these kind of techniques? So, so we are working on the visible now. Uh, so, we, so that's so we are about, you know, uh, uh, 600 nanometers, something like this. Uh, so uh, it doesn't mean that this is this is the limit. Uh, this is uh, this is just uh, this limited at the moment with the type of uh, lasers that we have convenient access to, uh, uh, and uh, presumably one can go one can go even even shorter. Well, so but I mean that that I guess is the free space wavelength. I mean the. Oh yeah, yeah the uh, plasmonic wavelength. Uh, the oh, oh, I see. So, so well, plasmonic wavelength is determined by the dispersion. So, so the 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 shortest uh, wavelength of plasmons we we measured was limited by our a near field spatial resolution. That's about twenty nanometers. So, so that's and uh, the wavelength of light was still about ten microns. So we we, we really have a, a pretty pretty significant confinement of these modes. So, so it's uh, I would say so. One limit is is the spatial resolution of the apparatus. Uh, also, uh, uh, another limit is that you, you know if you have uh, if you have very confined mode, then it's kind of it has flat dispersion, so it no longer move. It's no longer moving. So, so eventually you'll run into, into this type of problems as well. So 20 nanometers is what we've seen. Okay, that's interesting. That's actually very short. There's a question from Mark Steger. So, so Mark, I think you're unmuted now. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, very nice talk. Um, I was wondering uh, practically, um, if I understand you, you're illuminating either by broad field or through the uh, tip to the Heat diffraction limit. When you're illuminating broad field, what does this really mean? Because doesn't the tip shadow the immediate area that you're measuring? Uh, so okay. So uh, uh, I think we, uh, I think what we are, what we are really doing. So we are either using monochromatic light here, or a broadband light. So so that's in in either case. The illumination is diffraction limited, meaning that the entire device is is uh, uh, is um, uh, illuminated. The tip only picks up the local near field signal. So, so uh, in some cases there is a, there is far field shadowing uh, in this illumination, but it's actually not a very important effect because because tips are still. We, because we work in infrared frequencies where this wavelength is pretty gigantic even with, with, with commercial tips. So, so no shadowing is, is, uh, is really, uh, really important. Okay. Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, this is, um, this is very good. Uh, just keeping my eye on the time, actually, I don't see any more questions now. So I want to thank you and we'll move on. So well, thanks very much, Dmitry. That was a really lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you.